Lee. Joined now by Rivals National Recruiting Director, Rob Cassidy. Rob, how are you, sir? Good. Thank you guys for having me again. It's good to Man, be back. It's a how pleasure you? having you as always. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, the recruiting season doesn't end. It continues. The draft is coming up. There will be fallout from that. But right now, of course, Indiana with a great get last Friday. Uh, Mackenzie Mbako fills a gigantic hole for Indiana, but it also does a lot of things. It brings a, a ton of talent in that in that body. It uh, answers a lot of questions. It quiets some questions about Indiana being able to land the, the big guys, to be able to beat the Kansases and so forth. So that that did a lot of things for Indiana. Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, I think that you know, I think that their work with. Uh, Jalen Hood Chapino last year and getting him to be one and done uh, really kind of showed a lot of these top level guys that, hey, this is a place that you can go and play for Mike Woodson and you can develop in one year pretty quickly. You know, I was talking to Liam McNeely, who was the target for Indiana on Saturday, uh, and he was talking about how, you know, he's he's going to keep an eye on, you know, Mbako's development. You know, if he goes there and it looks like he's destined for one and done, that's encouraging to him, you know, for, you know, and these things kind of compound on themselves. You know how that goes. If, if momentum starts to roll, it can pick up pretty quickly. Yeah, and Indiana has, uh, besides Liam, they've got Asa Newell down there. Uh, that they, they continue recruiting and having that pipeline would be great for Indiana because you know that they're coming out of, if they're coming out of Mont Baird, they're talented. Uh, and with Malik Renew on the current roster, I'm sure they're keeping tabs on him as well. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think just in general, you know, it's, it's, you know, it could help with guys like Dylan Harper too. You know, I mean, this is just, it can get beyond Montvert because these guys, these days, it's not like it used to be where you just know the guys you went to high school with. All these kids know each other they're, because they're all playing on the circuit together, either whether it be Nike or Adidas. And it's kind of a more of a close-lit group of, of elite recruits than it was 10 years ago just because of the way AAU set up. So when something starts going right for one high-profile high, high profile prospect at your school, it, it can turn into four or five. And, and everyone thought that uh, he was going to Kansas. Of course, Kansas was loaded, was, was already a, probably an odds-on favorite to win the national championship without his arrival or without him coming there. Uh, I, I don't know if it was the challenge of helping be someone else be that uh, or not wanting to compete against A.J. Adams and someone that was already in his position in Kansas and getting less minutes. Yeah, you know, I think just like everything else, it's always a combination of things. I think that everything you said probably played into it. But also, you know, I, I, we we cannot be naive to turn our backs on name, image, and likeness. Like, there's always a money factor. And whether Indiana's money beat Kansas or not, we'll never know. But they had to at least be able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. And I think that says a lot about Indiana recruiting going forward. If they're able to do that, I mean, we know the kind of money that Kansas gave Hunter Dickinson. Uh, if they're able to, to play in those kind of wait in those kind of waters with the big boys, uh, I think it, it says the future's bright on the recruiting trail. And, and I know, and Kansas added eight players. So, and that's along with put, they paying Hunter Dickinson the money that we know they're paying him. These other seven guys are not there for free. Uh, <laughs> so that, that's a money going on. Indiana also having added seven new faces as well. So, or, or they have added six so far with that open scholarship yet remaining. Um, of course, everyone looking towards adding another shooter in that spot, but they're not nearly with once they've added in Baco, I don't think that they're in as much need as they were. They still need to fill it, of course, but they've got a lot of talent around him, although some of it's young, but they have the ability. I think that people will kind of start standing in line for this, this position now because of what is around them at Indiana. Yeah, I think so too. You know, I think that, you know, you look at that roster now and the talent is there, obviously. You never really know what it's going to look like until it gets on the floor and meshes together. But when you get a guy like Mbaco in there, who a lot of people think is probably a one and done guy, there are going to be a lot of eyes on him. And if there are a lot of eyes on him, there's going to be a lot of eyes on Indiana, which makes that position desirable, you know, because there's going to be eyes on you in turn. Uh, and then there's other recruits in Indiana well, that, that, that have this next season, uh, guys like uh, uh, Floyd Badunga, who is just yeah. a game changer and one that I think Indiana really needs to land just because of all the situations. He's here. He's, you know, he's, he's up the road uh, where they are right now, that momentum. That's the thing that Indiana hadn't had. They did not have momentum. I know that they had Trace Jackson Davis for the for seemed like five years and they were able to land Jalen Huchifino, 
but I didn't think that they had momentum when they, even when they had and they ended Malik. They were great recruits, but it was like uh, this feels like more of a momentum starter, um, partly because of what opinions of national pundits that filters down to kids. I think um, when people, a lot of the guys didn't think that the Indiana was going to land him. I wasn't. I didn't think that until toward the end of the day. Uh, but I, I think it changes perceptions in a lot of people's minds. Yeah, I think it definitely does. And I think also, you know, the, the biggest momentum builder in recruiting these days is just can you get your guys to the NBA? And they starting to show that they can, you know, and quickly. You know, you look at Shafino and you look at, you know, if Ibako does the same thing where he comes there and shines immediately as a freshman, that's when these high-profile recruits, because these guys, you know, the, the very top guys don't want to be in college for more than one year. And they want to go to a place that's going to get them in and get them out. And if you can do that and you can prove to do that, then you start landing some of these high-profile guys because not only do you have the name, image, and likeness money, you've got the brand name that Indiana has, and now you've got Mike Woodson has proven he can put freshmen in the NBA. It gets really hard to recruit against a guy like that if it all starts compounding. Yeah, and I'll say this uh, you know, every day. If, if watch the draft. Look at the top 20 guys that get taken in the draft. These are not seniors that are get taken. They're not no. These are virtually all freshmen in the top 20 being taken in the NBA draft. Yeah, those days are over where it's, uh, you know, your three- and four-year players are getting taken high. Those days are over because the NBA is looking for upside. And the younger you are and the better you are, the more attractive you are to NBA people because if everything's equal, they'll take the 20-year-old over the 23-year-old every day. Of the week. Uh, Indiana, the, the, with this uh, other spot remaining, uh, they've got a lot. They've got Gabe Cups coming in, who was with us on the show yesterday. And, and just, I haven't met him before, but just having that conversation, he seems like a very, he's a very relaxed kid. He wasn't nervous. He was, he, he was very easy. He did this very easy. So I use that as a gauge from their personality. If, if they can do that, then, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of a relaxed person and he's, he can shoot. The Kai Newton is coming in. They've got CJ Gunn back. Caleb Banks back. Uh, they've got a lot of talent already there, but they still have a, an open scholarship that they can go pull out of the portal as well. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good form. I don't know who that's going to be. I haven't had enough time to really kind of track who they're kind of recruiting out of the portal now in the wake of the Mbaco thing. But like you said, I think him being there uh, makes it more attractive. He's a, you know, he's... He's an, I think he's a one and done guy. I think he's got to develop, you know, as a shooter a little bit if you want to nitpick him. Um, but as far as you know, putting the ball in his hands and letting him play both forward spots, he can take a guy to the basket. He can put the ball on the floor. He really does it all at his size. And he's definitely a first guy off the bus. Wait until you see this guy in person. He looks like a, you know, he looks like a divorced father too. He's just like a grown man. Yes. Uh, and Indiana has maybe the most important piece yet. A, a fifth year senior point guard um, running the show for them. How important is that having that piece with a lot of these younger guys around him? Yeah, you know, that's what I always call the Bill Self formula, right? Is he'll have a few really talented freshmen, and then there's always two or three veterans, most times a point guard, uh, when he's going to win the national championship. And those are the years that he does it. Um, and I think it is. It's a winning formula if you can perfect it. It's really hard to do to strike that balance in this day and age of the transfer portal. But if you can get a veteran point guard and you can surround him with talent, you can go a really long way. And I think that, you know, this, you know Bill Self will tell you himself that's how he does it. In his Rob, best Cassie, Rob Cassie, National Director of uh, Recruiting from uh, Rivals with me now. I, I, and I'm out of the prediction game, but it's just too hard to resist doing it for fun. <laughs> uh, but the only thing I can say about the Big Ten right now is, I like Indiana where they are now, and I like them up there with, with Purdue. I don't know. I still have Michigan State. I'm going to have them on a line by themselves for the moment, but I've got Purdue and Indiana A and B right there. Yeah, you know, I think it's I think that's fair. I haven't had a chance to really – it's been so hectic for me, and you know how everybody's roster is in flux. Outside of those top three, I haven't really had a chance to sit down and look at who even plays for who anymore <laughs> because, you know, you know, I know that Michigan is kind of in shambles. Um, I think that I think that yeah, I agree with those top three without sitting down and really digging into everybody's roster. It's just so hard for somebody in my shoes right now to keep up with everything until it's all over. And then I could sit down and look, oh, he landed there because I'm sure I've missed some transfers. Uh, just being on the road at William and High School kids the last three weeks. 
that it's it been uh, it's been tough to keep up. It changes by the minutes. Yeah, you go in, you stop at McDonald's for lunch and it's changed uh, when you come out. There's a they have a, two, a completely different team. I mean, think about Kansas has eight new faces. Indiana has seven new faces. Both of those are more than half of your scholarship allotments. No, it's it's crazy because every fan base, every single fan base at the beginning of the year is like, oh, we're doomed. Our whole team's in the portal, but they don't realize that everybody's whole team is in the portal. <laughs> you know, so it's like you're no further behind than anybody else, really, unless you're Duke, where every it was somehow they seem to retain everybody. But it's not a unique problem to any university where they oh, I have to replace the whole roster because everybody has to replace the whole roster now. This is the new normal in college basketball, and we're all getting used to it. And for fans, they're going to have to get used to the fact that uh, the days of following their favorite players for three and four years are pretty much over. Yeah, and I'm sure every once in a while you'll get a guy that's the exception to the rule. But, yeah, for the most part, those days seem to be done unless they get some kind of different sort of legislation passed, which I think they probably will eventually. I just don't – I don't think that they're going to let this go on unchecked forever. Just because, you know, it is good for the players, and I support the players' ability to transfer and make money, but it's not particularly good for the sport, I don't think, as far as you know, following favorite players and things like that. So we'll see what they do in the future. I, I don't know what they'll do, but I figure there'll be some legislation. With, with things being as loose as they are right now, I don't know, I don't know how you track it all. There's so many things. How do, you, how do you keep up with it all? So it has to have some kind of – there has to be boundaries. There has to be fences and, and lines. And I think I think that there has to be contracts. I, I cannot believe that you, you can have the ability to just bounce, 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 uh, even when a professional can't do that. Yeah, I think that's kind of, I, I, I think that's probably ultimately where we're headed. I don't know how that'll look or how that will be drafted, but some form of contracts will probably eventually happen. Because like you said, you know, and it's, you can't even do this in NBA free agency, you know, <laughs> it's, it's every year's free agency. And it's just, I think it's going to make it over the long period, the long term, it's going to make it harder for fans to stay engaged, especially when their team isn't winning at a high level every year. Uh, it'll be easier to check out for apathy to send, I think, if you're a bad team. And not only are you a bad team, you can't have that fan favorite that keeps people around anymore because your roster's turning over. Uh, I just feel like the low-end teams will see the fans check out a little bit, you know? And I, I know the rosters are still changing. There's still going to be action after the draft with the draft uh, and people not staying going, whatever happens with that. Who Who's done themselves the best that you can see so far? I think Kansas is going to be a mighty interesting team. I really, I mean, it stinks that they lost Zuby for them, um, but it's going to be fun to watch Dickinson and some of those guys there at KU. I think they've done great in the portal. Uh, I think, I, you know, all things considered, I think Andy, Indiana's done a lot of recruiting this year. It's going to be, it'll be interesting because, because you never know. Like, you can look at this and you say, oh, this, these teams have done really well. But I wouldn't have looked at Kansas State last year and been like, oh, this team has done great in the portal. And then they almost win the Big 12 and they go to the Elite Eight with a roster full of guys nobody knew who they were before the season starts. It's so much about fit and chemistry that college basketball has become kind of a coin flip until you see the players on the floor. I mean, you have no idea. I mean, look at last year. You know, North Carolina misses the NCAA tournament somehow. It's just uh, – I, I, I'm out of the prediction game too, like you said, because it's just too hard. Yeah, and it's not going to change because you talk about those teams gelling and they're so new. Some of them don't gel until – late February, March, and you don't know who's coming. And that's why we got to see the joy of what we saw in the NCAA tournament last year with uh, all of those 50, 57 yeah. flavors. Uh, it, it was incredible. But then you look at Florida Atlantic, they got everybody back. Yeah, they're, that's going to be an interesting one to watch too. You know, they're not, they're going to be the hunted now. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how they respond to not kind of being a surprise underdog team. Um, but, you know, like you said, it's all the whole conference, every conference, that conference especially, is going to be different. Are they the best team in that conference? Who knows? Because everybody's roster's new. Like, it's so hard to, like, look at last year's – because you can't predicate anything on last year's success or failures anymore. It doesn't matter because the whole – your whole team's turned over. And did, did just the tournament alone itself, I, I think it, it changed how I'm going to look at this season. Did it change how – we're expecting college basketball to be this year? I mean, for that to discontinue, pick up where it left off? 
yeah, you know, the, <laughs> the logic in me says there's no way it can be that insane again. But I guess it could be. I mean, we don't really know anything about this new era yet until it plays out. And I think we're all just kind of kind of putting our seatbelts on and going along for the ride and seeing where it takes us. I don't really know what to expect for this season. And I guess that's kind of fun. Yeah, exactly. Because there's a lot of teams that are always stronger in the beginning just because of talent. It takes a while for a chemistry to break in. But uh, then you have uniqueness like Purdue. Purdue is a unique team because of having a South East. There, there aren't any other Zach Eadies out there that I that I can think of. So that makes Purdue just a unique team. Uh, doesn't make them great. It makes them unique. Yeah, at least you know what you're getting from your star there. A lot of other players schools don't. But, you know, again, what he's surrounded with has changed some. You know, it makes him unique in the way there's a steadying anchor and a steadying force. Uh, and there's not a lot of other, like you said, there's nobody else like him in the college game. I, I don't know. I don't. What I want to know is how these Vegas people are setting these, like, you know, they set these win total over-unders before the season. I don't know how you would set that right now because I you don't know anything about anyone. 